This is uh, based on the metabolism. And the um, like the homework right, you know, work on the graph. Like, you can help the graph. Yeah, I don't get that. Okay. Uh, any other questions on the midterm solutions? Have you had a chance to look at it? Um, do you want to understand how to add up these RAM functions and set functions to produce? Any pattern that is given to that. And do you also want to go through how to do it on Simulink or just no, understand it? Just understand how it works. Okay. <coughs> uh, let's, let's do this by graphically looking at a function and then graphically how to add it and then I'll give you an analytical one and you'll see how that that will be represented uh, graphically okay so suppose I have a function uh, u of t uh, which I want it to be like this Nice house like structure. Okay. I want the function to have a step part and I'll mark these positions. Let's say the t axis 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 0 from that point on. on okay. So the question is how do I construct this using more primitive functions? And uh, why you can do that is because the superposition allows you to add these. And the output will be simple addition of the output from each one of these signals. Okay. So uh, what I need to do is I need to identify functions that I can simply add together. So the first function is going to be uh, And let me put some axis labels here too. So this is one. That is two. Okay. So it is stepping up to one at t equal to one, and then ramping up to two over a period of one minute, and then remaining constant at two, and then ramping down uh, from two to one uh, between three and four. Okay. And that's what I want to construct. So the first part and first component I need is simply a step function. But a step function, by definition, simply increases the input from 0 to 1 and keeps it on 1 forever from that point onwards. Okay. So you have to realize that. So if you're plotting that as a function of t, then for t greater than 1, that function is going to keep the value at 1. To that, I need to add an additional function that will take it from 1 to 2. And the function that I need is going to be a, a ramp function starting at 1 and going up by 1. So it's going to be this function. Okay. So if I add these two, if I sum them up, what will be the net result of those? Okay, that's what you need to understand. Okay, so this function, of course, the RAM function is going to go to infinity. It will go forever as t goes to infinity. Okay, with a slope of one in this particular case, because that's what I want to achieve. I want to increase it from one to two over a unit of uh, one to two. Okay, are you guys with me so far? So if I add these two, what are we going to get? The result. 
of addition. I'm just going to do one step at a time so that you see the whole process. Okay? So the result of addition of this, can you take a guess? If I take, when I say add, what does it mean? It simply means I'm taking the y-axis from the first graph, adding it to the y-axis from the second graph, plotting it in the third graph. That's how I add two functions. Right? So if I take, for example, when time is here, when I take zero and uh, it's zero here also, the ramp function, by definition, is zero here. But it starts ramping up at that point and then increases forever. Okay? So when I add these two, I'm going to get zero up to this point. And then as t equal to 1, the step function kicks it up by a discontinuous value to 1. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding this value of 1 to this value of 0. So the net result is 1. Now if I take a small step to the right, I'm going to add this value to this value whatever that value happens to be. For example, if t is 0 0.2, uh, sorry, 1.2, then what will be y for this second graph? 0.2, right? And I already have 1, so that's going to become 1.2. If you understand that, the rest will all fall into place automatically. Okay? So what, what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to add these two graphs. And adding these two graphs simply means at every value of t on the x-axis, like the red line that I have, you have to read the y value from the first graph, the y value from the second graph, and plot it on the third graph. That's the summation. Okay. So if this value is 1.2, what does this value be? So, I have to put it at 1.2. Is that clear? <laughs> that is the essence. If you understand that, then the rest will or you'll figure out automatically. You, you have a conceptual problem in understanding what I mean by add these two signals. Okay? And when you do that in the signal link, it will automatically do this operation for you. Okay? So, it's just going to take the value from this graph and take the value from that graph, add it, and plot it there. So if you do this, you're going to get the graph going like this. So the summation of the step function and the ramp function is going to give you a graph that will look like this. The net result will be steps up and then it goes up forever. Any questions? What do I do next? I want at 2, at time equal to 2, I want to cancel the effect of this ramp because the ramp keeps on going forever, right? So I need to add an additional function that will cancel the effect of the ramp. Now, if you understand that, you tell me what should be the third function that I have to add to this result. So this result is the add addition of two functions, a step and a ramp. Now I want to level this off. So I need to figure out what function that I need to add to the previous two, that is to this function, so that I make this uh, level at this point. Step down, a ramp function going down at the same rate as the other function is going up, so that when you add them, they'll cancel out. Okay? So I need to have a ramp function starting at t equal to 2, okay, so 1, 2, but it should be going down. Remember, again, ramp function is defined as 0 prior to that, and then it starts going down at a certain rate. And in Simulink, you can control both the slope and the origin where it starts going down. Have we taken too complicated an example? So now when you add this, it's as if you're going to add a function that goes down at the same rate as the other function is going up. So when you, th this will be negative now, okay, because this is going down. So when you add the negative part to the positive part, 
flowing from there, they will cancel out, giving you the net result, which will be the horizontal part. I'm sure uh, I'm boring some of you to that, but uh, it's important to get everybody on the same uh, level. Okay. So, what do you do next? Okay. Remember, the original objective was to construct this function. So, we have now gone up to this part by adding a step function, a ramp function, and then a negative ramp function to cancel the positive ramp function. Now what do I need? I need to bring it down. So I need to have another ramp function starting at t equal to 3, but it will go from the 0 to the negative. So that's going to bring it down. But that ramp function is going to go forever. So you need to have a positive ramp function to cancel its effect at t equal to 4. And then a step function at 4 to bring it down. Maybe I've taken too a complicated an example, but what I would recommend is, uh, if you are having difficulty, go through this one more time. Construct examples like this, and try to figure it out by your own thought process, and then implement it in simulating and see whether it agrees with that or not. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Don't, don't hesitate. Oh, the set, the set solution. Um, okay. Yeah, I was going to do the reverse example, which is you are given an analytical expression, and you need to map this out graphically. So here what is happening is the U of T stands for a unit step function. And this occurs at T equal to 0. So at T equal to 0, you're going from 0 to 1. Okay? And that function will remain at 1 forever, except now you are subtracting a magnitude of 2. So you're multiplying it by 2. You, you should be able to, this is a good question that you raised. You should be able to do the same thing with the RAM functions too. Maybe you'll go back and revisit that. Here, what is happening is u of t minus 1 is a unit step function. Its direction is negative, so it goes back, and it occurs at t equal to 1. Because the unit step function is defined as 0 for t less, argument less than 0, and 1 for argument greater than 0. In this case, the argument is t minus 1. When t minus 1 is greater than 0, the function steps up or down. That means t is greater than 1 in this case. Okay? But t is greater than 1, so it is this part that decides when on the x-axis the flip is going to occur. And the multiplication factor, whether it is plus 2 or minus 2, decides which way it is going, step up or step down, what is the magnitude. And so that is going to, now we are adding these two, adding the first two terms. If you add the first two terms, you are going to get a function that looks like... Uh, just go forever. If you add only the first two parts, that is this part. Okay. So it goes up and then comes down and then stays there at minus 1 forever. So it is a third one which says at t equal to 3, bring it back, add to that plus 1. So that's the one that brings it back up. Okay. Is that clear to you? T minus 3 is the one that is being, now we are going to add, now we are going to add at t equal to 3, a positive step function. So this is a, this was, this was going like this, so I'm going to bring it back to this. Okay? The best way is to take a few more examples and work it out, and if you have difficulty, come and see me. We can go through more examples in the office. Okay? Don't want to take too much of time from the class. Um, but what you should be able to do would be things like uh, 
in this case, instead of uh, ramp being 1, if it is plus 2, for example, the slope is plus 2, and to cancel it or to bring it down at a different rate, take it up at one rate and bring it down at a different rate, so you should be able to manipulate these things, but it's simply addition of all these functions. And you need to understand what is the basic definition of a step function and a ramp function is. And any other questions on your midterm exam? If you had a chance to look at it. If, uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to drop by and we can go through it. Okay. So, in the last lecture, I think is a very important one. You need to understand the concept in that. And please, again, if you have any questions, ask me now. The process of linearization of a nonlinear differential equation around a deviation variable that gives you. Uh, a transfer function. Okay. And you can then use the transfer function to analyze the dynamics around that steady state and to implement control action. So what we want to do now is expand. So there is really no new knowledge in this lecture today. We are going to just expand this idea to interacting and non-interacting systems. Okay. So we, we are going to consider the same problem of uh, drainage. But what is happening is there are two scenarios that you have. In the one on the left, <coughs> you will see that the first tank is draining into the second tank, which is draining out. So Q is a flow rate that you can control as an input, and there is a valve on the outlet, and its resistance is given by R1. And the drainage rate, Q1, from the first tank is proportional to the height. The larger the height, the larger the head, so it's going to drain at the rate. Now, this is a linear assumption. We'll do that first, and then we'll see uh, how to generalize that to a nonlinear problem. Now, from understanding the physical description of this problem, I want you to figure out the idea of interaction. Okay? And I'm going to ask you to think about a few scenarios. So it is draining into second tank, and the second tank is draining at a certain rate Q2. The second scenario is where the pipe is connected to the bottom of the second tank, okay? and there is still a valve. And uh, so the inlet flow rate is still controlled by Q of T, and the two heights, H1 and H2, are the ones that we are interested in monitoring and predicting how they are going to change uh, as, as you change Q of T. Let me ask you a few questions from your fluid mechanics question uh, course. Um, will the height H2 be affected by changes in flow rate Q? I'm not asking you to write a mathematical model, but physically, intuitively, what would you expect from your experience in fluid mechanics and just observing flow problems? If Q increases, H increases in both the times, or only one tank, or both? Okay. Uh, now, if if I increase uh, Q2 by changing the resistance, I open up the valve, will that affect H1 in the first case? How about the second case? If I increase, uh, um, if I increase the flow rate, Q2, by decreasing the resistance, will it affect H1 in the second case? The answer is, Intuitively, you expect that it will affect. Okay. So, now that we have understood what is the nature of the interaction between two systems, now, a chemical plant is admittedly much more complicated because there are thousands of variables and they are interacting. So, what you do in your distillation column may have an effect on a reactor downstream. Okay. And if there is a recycle, what happens in the reactor may actually affect what happens in the first, first part of it. So, depending on the complexity of the process, one unit can affect the performance of the other unit or not. Okay? So we need to understand this nature of interaction and capture it in our model and understand the structure of the model. So that by simply looking at the model, you can say, OK, these are interacting systems. How can I look at the dynamics? And how can I understand it? How can I design control for those? So 
um, but that's our goal now, to try to develop models for these. Any questions on that? Well, I'm going to write down the model equation, which is coming from conservation of mass. So for the first tank, tank 1, the rate of accumulation that you see on the left-hand side, which is dgt of the area of the tank multiplied by the height, which gives you the volume of the tank. So the rate of change of volume of the tank is equal to the rate at which volumetric chloride is entering the tank and the rate at which it is leaving the tank. And the rate at which it is leaving the tank depends on H1. Whereas the rate at which you, it enters is something that you control. It's an input variable to the model. You decide how much uh, uh, flow is coming into the tank. But for the second tank, for tank 2, it's the same thing. A2 times dh 2 dt equals Q1 H1 because what is output from this tank 1 is input to the tank 2. Okay, so it is the same Q1 which acts as the output from tank 1 but input to the tank 2 and minus uh, Q2 H2 which is the output from this tank. And here I need to give you the relationship between the flow rate, the outlet flow rate and the height because I've indicated that Q1 is a function of H1 and Q2 is a function of H2. That comes from fluid mechanics, understanding of the fluid mechanics. But here I'll give you the algebraic relationship. In one model, you're saying that Q1 is proportional to the height. And as we have said, it is not true. In reality, it is square root of H1. But this is, gives us a linear model to deal with in, initially. Okay? So R1 is a constant, which somehow captures the valve open, percent valve open. Okay, so we can look at this as four equations in four unknowns. The unknowns are H1 and H2 and Q1 and Q2. And all these can change with time. If I keep the inlet by a step change or an impulse or a sinusoidal input for Q of T, then I can change all H1, H2, Q1, Q2. But two are algebraic equations and two are differential equations. I'm now learning to deal with a system of differential equations. Now, are these differential equations coupled? What do I mean by a system of equations being coupled? Simply means that one equation affects the other. Every equation affects every other equation. That is, every equation depends explicitly or implicitly on all other variables. Then you will call that system as a completely coupled system. In this case, H1 is affected only by the first equation. What happens to H2? the second equation does not influence H1 because there is no H2 in the first equation. If the variable H2 appears in the first equation, that means what happens in the second tank, whatever you do to affect it, will affect the first one. But here, first one operates by itself. So this is what you call as non-interacting system. First one does not interact with the uh, first one does interact with the second one. Second one does not interact with the first one. But the second one, as you see, H2 is affected by what happens in H1 and H2. So the second is affected by what happens in the first tank. But the first tank is not affected by what happens in the second tank. Any questions? Uh, in the control terminology, you will call this as a non-interacting system. But I personally choose to call this as a forward interaction because that captures the meaning much more precisely, I think, because it is interacting in the forward way. Whereas the second one in the control literature in the book, you will find it as an interacting system because H1 affects H2 and H2 affects H1. Okay? That's what is, uh, but in the first case, they call it as a non-interacting system, but it is actually a one-way interaction. What happens in H1 will affect H2. That's the conceptual part. Now we're going to do a lot of just mathematical manipulations, but again, something that you have seen before. Okay. So the first thing that we do is I get rid of Q1 and Q2. Okay. I can do a Laplace transform of this and get uh, Q1S equals H1S over R1. Okay. So I can treat it as four equations and four unknown, but it's easier in this case because I can do the elimination. So I'm replacing Q1 by H1 over R1 in the first equation, and then I'm doing, uh, I'm separating H1 on the left-hand side, and these parts I think you're already familiar with. So, and then I'm taking the Laplace transform of this. Take the Laplace transform of this equation, 
to go to the algebraic domain, to the Laplace domain. So here A1 is the cross-sectional area, R1 is the resistance, these are known numbers. Times S times H1 of S. That is the Laplace transform of H1 of T. I have done the subtraction from steady state, so I'm already putting this in terms of a deviation variable. Plus H1 of N, which is the Laplace transform of this term, equals R1 times Q of S, which is the Laplace transform of the portion function. And then separate H1S times uh, tau 1. Tau 1 here is going to be A1 times R1. Tau 1 is the time constant for the first tank, which is a product of A1 times R1. Okay. So that is a first order system for the first tank. And it does not depend on what happens to the second tank. Okay. That's why they call it as uh, a non interacting system. But what we want is to relate the output Q1 to the input Q. Q is the input here. This is the input. What this model relates is the height. Okay, so this gives you H1 divided by uh, Q as equal to R1 divided by tau 1 S plus 1. What I want is not the height, but I want the output. Okay, so how do you get this one? As I said earlier, simply go back to this algebraic equation and in terms of the deviation variable, take the Laplace transform that will give you Q1 equals H1 um, over R1. Okay, and then you can substitute for um, this um, H1, H1S, okay, as equal to Q1 times R1, and then rearrange it as an input output relationship. Okay, so the output is Q1 and the input is Q. This relates the input to the output for that particular process. Now, in such a uh, situation, H1 is an internal variable. And this is a terminology that you may come across later on. It's called the state variable. It controls the state of the tank, the height of the uh, level in the tank. And Q1 is the output. These are just labels. But we are basically dealing with the first order equation, which gives rise to uh, a first order transfer function. Any questions for that? Do I tend to go fast through these maths? Do you want me to? Well, one model is I'm now using a prepared note, so I'm kind of going through it quickly. I have to write it down if it slow me down a lot. Is that going to be more helpful to you, or if you find no difference, then we'll continue to do this. Otherwise, I'll stop writing things since I'm not giving you notes ahead of time. Think about it and uh, let me know. Because I've, this is something that I have dealt with in previous courses also. Students do find that I tend to go fast because I'm the most prepared. I don't know whether you feel that. It's in your hands to slow me down. Okay, you can always say, repeat that, explain that. You like having this job. Okay. Right. So here is, for example, a place that I just jumped. Similarly, H2 equals. I've not really shown you how to get this all the mathematical stuff, but it is exactly the same process with the second equation. You need to work with this equation, go through the same step of uh, doing a Laplace transform, and using Q1, okay, Q1 is now going to be the uh, input to this. And you can see the relationship between how the output of one becomes the input of the second one. So here Q1 is the output. From the first tank Q1 in the transform variable is the output, but the second one that is the input, and H2 is the internal state variable, that is the height of the tank. But you can get rid of that again and uh, write it in terms of Q2 if you like. But this is an important step which I kind of already tested you in the exam to see whether you can put together a series of transfer functions. And all we're doing here is H2 is given by R2Q1 divided by tau 2 S plus 1. But Q1 is given by this, Q of S from the first equation. So using that, you can write it as R2 times Q divided by tau 2 S plus 1 times tau 1 S plus 1. All you're doing is replacing Q1 from the first equation. Now, this is such an easy task to do in the algebraic world. This is why Laplace transform is useful. What would be the equivalent of if I want to consider the two systems together in differential equations? You'll end up with a second order equation. Okay? 
writing the two equations, it is two first order equations is equal to a second order equation. Okay? So if you're solving it in the differential equation in time domain, what you need to do is solve for H1 from the first equation, which will be an exponential solution, and put that as a forcing function on the right hand side, solve it again. So you're now solving a much more complicated right hand side with a forcing. That is in the Laplace domain, it's simply a product, product of these two transfer functions. And in Simulink, it's just two blocks, one feeding into the other. It becomes really much more easy to deal with. So this is what the effective transfer function between the input flow rate Q, which you can consider a step or impulse or whatever you want, and the height in the second tank. But once you have the height in the second tank, you can always get the flow rate because Q2 is equal to H2 divided by R2. So in the transform variable, Q2 will be equal to H2 divided by R2 in terms of S. So if you know H2 divided by R2, and that gives you the flow rate, the exit flow rate from the second tank. Any questions on that? Here is an example with the numerical uh, substitution. To simplify it, we are looking at the first case, the non-interacting case. I am taking tau 1 to be 1, tau 2 to be 0.5, and R2 to be 1. And the problem is sketch the level in tank 2, level in tank 2, if a unit step change is made in the inlet to tank 1. So I make a step change to Q, and how does the tank level 2 change? How do I do this? What are the methods that we know? That's it. If you have math, this is why I want to have a second exam in MATLAB. Because you can go to TF, define the transfer function, and plot it out. So if you're doing it by hand, what do you need to do? You need to take that transfer function, do a partial fraction. That transfer function, do partial fraction from that. And that I would expect you to do. It's still a quadratic. Okay? And then invert it, and then plot it by hand. Whereas in MATLAB, you can do it in uh, few minutes. Okay. So this is the transfer function after I substitute the time constant, 1 and 0.5. And I'm told that Q is a unit step function. So you should remember, for a unit step function, the transfer function is 1 over F, unit. So that's what determines the numerator is 1. The denominator is 1 over F. Okay. So I've shown you how to do it in MATLAB. Let's just plot it and maybe do it in Simulink also. Um, actually, let I, I have indicated there are many ways of doing it. And in the exam, you are free to choose whatever way unless I specify I'm testing a particular way. So here I have illustrated how to construct the transfer function in, using symbolic toolbox. That is 1 over s times 1 over 1 plus s times 1 over 0.5 s plus 1. Then take the inverse Laplace, get the time domain solution that you see, and then plot. But all these steps are automated for you in the step function. Okay? So you can use the simplest way to do that would be uh, in MATLAB define S equals transfer function S. Okay? So that sets up a transfer function object for you. And then G is equal to 1 divided by S divided by S plus 1 divided by 0 0.5 times S plus 1. So I'm going to make some deliberate mistakes to see whether you are catching. Okay. So I have defined the transfer function that I had, and these are the common mistakes that you can make too. So here is the transfer function. Okay. 1 over S. 1 over s plus 1, 1 over 0.5 s plus 1. Okay. And that is what I typed. G equals that. So I have that transfer function entity that is defined. If I make a step change, what kind of response do you expect for the height? That's what you will expect? Oh, okay. Uh, let me 
do this. So I'm calling a step function. Say, take the transpose function g, apply a step input, and plot me the graph. Does it make sense? That's all you got, right? But does it make sense? These are the things you need to you need to have an alert mind to see whether it makes sense because computers can give you results, but you need to analyze as an engineer whether it makes sense or not. This is saying that the height is changing linearly. Right? I'm making a step change in the input. Now, if it were a first-order system, you already know what is the response of a first-order system to a step change. It's an exponential increase and then levels off to a new steady state. This one says there is no steady state. It's just going on forever. What did they do wrong? Right. When I am putting a step function, I should not put this one over s because the step function does that for me. All I need to do is give it the transfer function, which is the ratio of input to the output. And it will take the input as a unit step function. Okay? So this is the correct transfer function I need to pass to step. Now I get the correct response. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you to observe carefully what I'm doing and uh, make an observation and see uh, one divided by x plus one. This is say the first transfer function for the first time. Okay, so I'm going to now plot g and g one. What do you expect from the uh, from the statement? Yeah. Right, exactly. Okay. So G one is the green line that you see there. That is the step response of a first order system, which is a purely exponential increase. Okay. The second one is also an exponential increase, but initially there is a delay. And this is this is what you call a sluggishness. The second system doesn't respond as soon as you make the change in flow rate in the first tank. If I increase the flow rate in the first tank, its effect is going to be immediately felt only in the first tank. Right? So the level will start to rise, and when the level rises, the output flow rate will begin to increase from the first one. Then it will build up in the second tank. Okay? So the response from the second tank is this one, the blue one, the response from the first tank. The step function allows you to plot several transfer functions at the same time. That's another nice feature that you learn. Um, the other thing that you will notice is this I'm going to ask you to do as an exercise on your own. Calculate the derivative of this second solution at t equal to zero. I think I probably have all the statements here. Yeah. In fact, if you follow this, you'll we'll calculate, end up calculating what is the derivative of the solution in the time domain at t equal to zero. But from this graph, can you kind of guess what that might be? Zero. If you blow it up, we'll see that the second graph takes off with a zero tangent and then goes up. Okay. <coughs> okay, any questions on that? So one way of doing it is through this Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform. The other one is using the step function. The common mistake that we make is in giving the step function the correct transfer function. Step function expects only the transfer function part, input-output ratio, and then it applies 1 over s. So if you apply the 1 over s already, then you'll get uh, an incorrect graph. Now, how would I do this in Simulink? Do you want me to show this, or your If you're comfortable with it, then I won't. If you're quiet, I don't know how to interpret that. <laughs> I 
again, there are many ways of doing it. Um, so what do I need? You tell me. To implement that particular problem. Remember, the problem that we are solving is to plot the transient response for this particular case. Tau 1 is 1, tau 2 is 0.5, and R2 is 1. And you are given the transfer function. So you need a transfer function module on the continuous one. You need a step change, so from sources, pick up. Well, the simulink power comes from the library of input excitation that you can put in. And then from the sink, I need a Uh, just to generate a plot. Okay. This is just for routing the signal to a plotting routine. Okay. But if you don't do that, it will do all the calculations, but you won't get a graph. Right. Okay. But you can route this to a workspace. There are uh, other things. Um, now, if that, if that is your question, uh, the, your question might be, what are the other things? I don't know that answer. I'm not playing with each other. I always go to the scope, but feel free to play with them and you will learn. And I should also do that <laughs> if I have the time. Um, no, scope is just it's a plotting, it's a display routine, but you can send it out to this, which I've done often, sim out. So if you want to capture that data into a workspace, into a variable, then you put that and put the signal there, you'll have the variable defined in the workspace. So similarly, you can define variables in the workspace that can be used in your simulator. There's a mechanism for taking data from workspace and putting data back into the workspace. And uh, there is another one called uh, multiplexer. And I just want to show you what is that. Yeah. I'll put that there. So multiplexing is putting many signals into the same line. In the simulator, the best way to think of this is each line carries a signal and the box does something to the signal, transforms it, takes the input and converts it into something else. Okay. So a multiplexer will take simply two signals and combine them and pump it through the same wire if you like. Okay. So I'm going to now make a copy of this, control C, control V. And my finger is not good at this. <laughs> Are you guys able to see it? What I'm struggling to do? <laughs> Pardon me? Control V. And does it? Is there a way to automatically connect all these? I think there is. <laughs> okay. So I've connected the step input to the first transfer function which the output of which goes to the second transfer function because it is a non-interacting system. But in the second transfer function, the denominator time constant is 0.5. Okay. So I change that. And then I am passing that to the output. So if I just run this and then look at the output, I get the output from the second display. Okay, this is the one with a slope of zero at the beginning. Now I'm getting it at one. Why do I get it at one? The response starts going up at one. That is the default for the set function. Okay. So if you want to change that, go there and change that to zero. Okay. And then what I want to do is I want to plot the original signal. Sorry, um, I don't have a mouse here, so I'm struggling with this. So what this does is take the second signal from the input. So this one is going to show me how the input and the output is there. Okay, so if I run this again and plot it, 
So this time I get the step input, which is the yellow line that you see, and the response from the second. So the multiplexing allows you to take both signals and route it to the scope. Now, if I want to do also the output from the first step, Plotted on the same graph, what will I do? Add another into this mark. Instead of two inputs, it changes to three. Okay, so it opens up a third one and connects that to this part. This is real power of single link now, okay? Because it makes it very really easy. So I'm taking the sample from the output of the first process, feeding it to the scope. Input to the code and then output from the second one. So then I can compare all three uh, cases. So the same graph that I generated previously from output from the first one, which in this case is the blue one, the second tank, which is the purple one. Okay. So you should feel comfortable with simulating. The more you play with it, I think. Uh, you will find that it is an extremely easy tool once you understand the basic concepts which is implemented. Any questions? Okay. Uh, have you guys done uh, unit ops lab? In Simulink. Good question. <laughs> I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I cannot uh, tell you. There are. Um, the, the, if your question is how to put a delay, like a transfer function of the form, I can teach you how to do that. That is something like e to the power tau ds divided by tau 1s plus 1. If it is. More complex, uh, I don't think there is a built-in routine, one of those built-in modules. The input built-in module is for sine and cosine. So those are there as a, as a source library. Okay. And there is a delay function, and that has e to the power minus t, uh, t d tan. So you can combine that, you can take the output from that and feed it to the polynomial transfer function. So, but if you want any complicated one, if anybody finds out, please share with us. The time delay in simulink? Okay. I'm sorry, I just closed it. <laughs> Let's do it again. The reason I asked about the lab is there is something called control. Um, Control station. Have you guys used it? How many of you have not used that? You've not used it in the lab. Okay. So that's available in the computer lab, and it is also available in the unit off lab, apparently, where it is actually you can connect to the real process and take the data. So I wanted to show you this two tank example is there, how that works in there. Uh, but let me just answer this question and then. We'll Okay, so you take this transfer function and then uh, transportation delay. Take that. Feed one to the other and then force. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. You want to have two separate right. models on the same one. If you hit one, or hit one both, I think yeah. that. I would expect it because there's no conceptual reason why it should be. But I have not tried it. <laughs> it's good that you guys are raising these questions. If you're relying on me to find the answer, because I'm not going to be the expert, <laughs> you have to rely on yourself. So go to the lab and try it out. Okay. First thing is getting the questions in your mind, and then uh, how to answer it. We have seen enough methods that you should be able to feel confident that you can do that. 
Okay. So the delay time delay is one, and that's how you would do it. Okay. And let's see whether it makes sense. Does it make sense? That does that graph make sense? Right. So what is happening is the step is set to one. So the time that the response is actually starting at two. Step change is one, and then that is delayed by one minute. That's why the response is delayed by two minutes. So if you change it to zero and rerun it, you will see that graph shift to one. No, 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 no. The time delay is something that is inherent in the process, right? Because of the piping, for example, in the exam, it takes the liquid to go from point A to point B eight seconds. That's the delay between the first what is happening in the first reactor and at the T junction. Okay? So it has nothing to do with when you are inputting a step change. You could be inputting a step change to the first tank at T equal to zero. Still you will not see a response from the second tank until it goes through the delay process. And so the delay is something that is unique to the process. You need to understand what causes it and how to capture the time constant. Typically in uh, distillation columns, if you have 50 trays, you change the composition to the feed. To feel the effect of the composition on the 20th tray up there is going to take a while. Okay, and that is what you, you have as, as delay. Are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, we'll continue with uh, control station. Uh, do you want me to do the control station demonstration in the class? Because for those who have seen it, it will be the other way to handle this would be we will do it to a Thursday session. You want it in the class? Okay, we'll do it in the class.